the first time I ever heard of City, which was long, long before I was at Bloomberg, it was international, going all the way back to Walter Riston. And you've said global is at the very core of your identity at City. At the same time, the meaning of global and globalization is in flux, I think it's fair to say. It's not as easy as it once was. What does that mean for the global economy, from your point of view, and what specifically does it mean to City? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a huge amount that's out there around this globalization debt, and sitting at the uh, privileged seat of the helm of a, a very global institution, I can unequivocally say it isn't dead, but it is certainly changing. Um, and the ways that we see it changing, both digitization has been transforming industries and connectivity, but between a pandemic, a war, um, geopolitical tensions, other pieces, we're seeing um, a, a focus on resiliency around the world for our clients. Um, and that translates into, uh, we, Larry touched on a few of them, but it translates into energy security, it translates to food, water security, financial security these days, um, so, and uh, you know the, li the list goes on. But um, we've seen it with supply chains, we've seen it with companies' operations. There is this new thinking much more about operational risk. Um, and that's become a much more dominant part of globalization. And as we heard from Larry, I couldn't agree with him more. Um, these trends are driving more complexity um, into globalization. Um, those complexity costs can all be managed, but they are expensive. Complexity is one word for it. Another might be friction. There's more frictions from all those sources you identify. Does that inherently mean there's a drag on global growth, economic growth, and specifically, does it mean there's a drag on city growth? No, I, we, we've seen extraordinary growth. So if, I go, if we go back to, to what city is, um, we're essentially the, the bank of choice for uh, clients who have cross-border needs. We operate in 100 countries around the world um, with a local bank, and we, we wake up in about 160 that we'll do business in. But our, our core clients are 5,000 multinationals, and we move $4 trillion of volume just for those 5,000 companies daily in foreign exchange, in payments, in, um, tr in trade, and really everything that they need to operate their payrolls um, and their, their core supply chains and treasury businesses. That business last year grew its revenues for us by over 30%. And the volumes have um, exploded as clients have moved around Supply chains have been reconfiguring. Additional suppliers have been added in. Folk have been looking beyond China to look at not necessarily a pivot away, but what is the additional um, areas of supply chains that say in India or Mexico, um, parts of uh, all parts of Asia have been benefiting from as well. So that that shift in mix is uh, it, it has been adding growth opportunities, not taking it away, which is not always intuitive. Those are very impressive numbers. How much of that is the overall size of the pie growing? That is to say, cross-border transactions growing, as opposed to city taking market share from others? Um, we have taken market share, I'm delighted to say. In fact, we're about a year ahead of the plan, that I, or two years ahead of the plan, and we put in place a year ago, it says I must have lowballed those numbers. Um, but when we, when we look at it, I think the piece I'm really excited about are the mid-market companies, because they're, what we're seeing is they're either born digital players or they're ones who are participating in expanded global supply chains, and they're growing incredibly rapidly. So that's one of the areas of growth that we see the biggest opportunities. And you see it in the Middle East as they're looking at expanding and diversifying away from fossil fuels, adding more diversity into their economies. We're seeing it in you know, the extraordinary entrepreneurs that are around the world um, really taking advantage of the trends going on. Recession, something everyone's talking about, speculating about, nobody knows. Uh, I believe you said in the past, at least, you think it's quite possible there'll be a recession in the United States second half. 23. Also, you've talked about a recession in Europe. Is your view on that changing? Because some of the economic numbers are coming in a little bit more reassuring. Some people, even like Larry Summers, he still thinks it's more likely than that, but he's yeah. not as gung-ho on recession as he once was. Where are you? So we, we do have, we do, what we are seeing is different countries are at very different places, so you actually cannot speak in generalities. We expect to see a rolling series of country recessions, but short of anything, crazy happening geopolitically and 
this time last year we wouldn't have predicted what happened in Ukraine. Um, you've seen the tails come in, so you've seen the over-optimism from some about uh, soft landings and the economy's doing well, but equally you've seen the, down, the severe case downside also coming in. I think the general view in the States, certainly one we hold at City, is we expect to see a mild recession, um, largely driven by the painfully persistent service inflation. Um, it's coming off, but it's still pretty high, and we do expect to see central banks continue tightening as a result. Um, but the vulnerability that amplified previous recessions around the world are not present now. You know, banks are in very good shape, consumer balance sheets are in good shape, corporate balance sheets are in good shape, and I think that omens well for a m mild recessions when they come, um, rather than ones that we have to be worried about. Do we know exactly the state of the economy? Because there's a lot more that is in private behind uh, closed walls that since the great financial crisis, because of some of the regulations a lot has moved out of banks like yours that are highly regulated. Are we confident we know the situation? I, to the extent that anybody can be confident, um, you know, we, we serve clients across the spectrum, not just those who are in the public markets, but the private asset space is, is a very important one. And um, we certainly see um, very healthy corporate balance sheets across the board. Um, our net credit losses from the commercial bank and from our corporate banking business in the last year, I've never seen them so low. Um, and I think this, this omens well in our M&A activity, for example, the number of dialogues that we're having with CEOs about truly transformational M&A at the moment is enormous. It's not quite the pipeline it was last year, um, but it is a pipeline that um, as prices have become more reasonable and corporate balance sheets are in good shape, that um, CEOs are thinking transformation much more than you might think despite the fact that there's also an adjustment to the reality of um, more mild recessions um, ahead. Well, as you, as you suggested, there may be rolling recessions, different yes. places in the world at different yep. times. Uh, what does that mean for you as CEO of City? How do you manage that situation if that comes to pass? Uh, well, one has a wonderful team, <laughs> which is always very useful, and we have a team of, uh, around the world who's very used to managing a portfolio of very different situations. And when we look at where the world has been uh, over even the last couple of years, it, it, it's pretty resilient around many of the different changes and issues that are there. So we, we do stress tests constantly. Um, we do stress tests of things I never imagined doing stress tests of, um, and they are multi-dimensional, multi-faceted. Um, and then we make sure that we are in extremely good, rude health ourselves to be able to support clients where they need us either seizing opportunities from this or playing defense um, and make sure that we're there to support them. You're in the midst, I believe, of the transition right now, putting yeah. your own stamp, your own strategy on City. Uh, and, and it has various aspects to it. You laid out what the core businesses of City are. Let's start actually with some of the retail banks and some of the locations, such as, for example, Banamex in Mexico, but yeah. it's only one of several. How did you go about deciding that? And particularly, how are you managing margins? How are you picking the places around the world where you think you can make money, as opposed to the ones that, frankly, you'll never make a lot of money? So we, we looked at it and said, uh, as we looked at all the dynamics that are going on around the world, and we looked very dispassionately at our businesses and our position, and we said we want the bank to be simpler, focused, and better connected. And the businesses, therefore, we operate in need to be very connected together, and they all need to hang together to really serve um, the, the core client set, which are clients with cross-border needs. Um, and so we, um, we took the dispassionate view that we would double down on the investments, driving the connectivity and driving some of the cultural change to get uh, the firm to really operate the four core businesses that serve that client base around the world to um, standards of excellence in everything that they do. Um, and that therefore meant that we would exit um, the other businesses where we, we made the view that we weren't the best owner of, and it was therefore in the shareholders' interest that we divest them. We reinvest some of that money into um, making sure that our businesses are truly set up for the decade ahead and also to return the money to our shareholders. The biggest may have been Banamex in, yeah. in Mexico. 
Uh, I'm sure you're asked this incessantly, but where are you in that process? Oh. So the president said it's down to two bidders, but do you have any guess about a time horizon? Oh, I can give you, I have far more than a guess, but I'm afraid I'm not going to disclose that <laughs> today. Uh, we're, in, we're in very active dialogue there, um, and we're running through a dual process, both IPO and sale of the business. But that, it's, uh, it's of the consumer businesses there. Um, Mexico is a very important country in the world, particularly with the dynamics that are going on. And so um, we, are, we are retaining our institutional franchise there, which really connects Mexico to the world and the world to Mexico. And we've never seen so many inquiries from institutional clients around the world, be it in Japan, be it in Germany, be it in the States, be it even from others looking at diversifying um, beyond China um, into Mexico. And uh, we're pretty bullish about the opportunities from that side. We're just not the best owner of the consumer franchise there. I must have, I've been through a corporate transformation or two myself, and they're never easy in my experience. Yeah. Uh, and they're necessary, but never easy. One of the things you, you focused on- You just get on with them. Well, but yeah. one of the things you focused on was wealth management. Yes. And then you've just announced you're gonna have a, a change at the head of wealth management. Mm -hmm. That consumes a fair amount of, uh, of uh, bandwidth for the executive team. It sort of slows things down, in my experience, typically. When you're not sure who's in charge, it slows things down. Did you anticipate mm -hmm. that? No, I, um, we had had a head of the wealth management business for a couple of years who had really helped us integrate five or six different parts of the bank into a single division and put it into an integrated platform. And so we felt it was about the right time to then look at a shift in, in leadership. It was no more complicated than that. And uh, if a shift in leadership of a division slows the division down, you've got bigger issues than that. <laughs> and it won't slow us down. Um, so uh, no, I think it's just part of the normal evolution as you um, as you move talent around, and the head of that business is moving into another very important role in the firm. Um, I, I, my career has benefited from moving talent um, and growing by managing different businesses, and I, I think it's very important to do so. When you get through your transition, yeah, what's your comparative advantage for City? Why do oh. you beat the other guys? Well, we already have a, a private bank. The average net worth of our private bank client is about $450 million. Um, and that's, that's a lot. And these are the families who are the entrepreneurs that are shaping the world economy. Um, either they, they, they're typically first or the second generation. Um, and they are the ones that know City well um, because we've helped them go global. Uh, we've helped them grow, uh, we've helped them transform, and so they know and trust us as their core partner, and there are tremendous synergies and linkages across the bank, from the banking franchise, our markets franchise, to help them manage risk as they go global, um, raise up the financing they need. So they become family in many respects as well, and that, that's a huge competitive advantage and our commercial bank is present in almost 40 markets around the world, has been for many years. And so um, that's, a, that's an important engine. So we have a, we have a huge competitive advantage there. ESG, Environmental Social and, uh, yeah, Governance. For I've the longest it. time, it was a darling. Everybody wanted to talk about it, it was good. <laughs> now it's become quite polarizing, at least in some parts, certainly of the United States. And we've heard yeah. the likes of Lori Fink say they lost $4 billion, although they made up more than that. In inflows. What's your experience at City? Have you lost money because of ESG? No, um, but, but I think that's not really where we're focused. So when we look at it, the world's got a number of major transitions that we're going through. And to your point, these aren't, these aren't easy ones. So where we're focused on is helping, let's take climate, we're trying to make sure that there is both the realization of energy security um, for the world, which is critically important for economic growth, at the same time, is that there is the investment and the innovation required in sustainable um, green sources of energy and cleaner sources of energy. And we've got to solve both of them together. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, so our focus is trying to move the noise out the way and actually roll up our sleeves and get on with the hard work of how do we um, help support our clients who are investing in the innovations, get them to scale, that will get those cleaner technologies that we need up and running, at the same time as supporting clients who are also critical sources of energy um, for the world right now, and helping them with that transition, but recognizing this takes time. 
and, and how much of your time do you spend on making sure you're not part of the noise? Because it strikes me a lot of CEOs have inadvertently become poster childs of one side or the other in some of these issues. How do you make sure Jane Fraser doesn't get to be one of those poster oh, childs? I, I think it's maybe the benefit of being a fairly new CEO is that you're pretty focused on doing your day job. So you get pretty good at moving the noise out the way and just getting on with it. Don't find that difficult. One of the things we've had to deal with because of the pandemic is working from home, as yeah. it's called. And, and you've been uh, fairly outspoken, I believe, on the subject and not necessarily the same position as some other leaders of banks. And my, my more specific question is, in your experience, do you track productivity for people who work from home as opposed to people coming to the office? And if so, what have you found? Well, I, I'll, I'll get to that, but I would, I'd start off just by saying that I think the, the positions that we've taken where we're recognizing we're going through a very human crisis during the pandemic was one that um, was an advantage for us in being able to attract and, and retain and get the most out of our talent. And we do measure productivity very carefully. And I, I am incredibly proud of our people and what they did in terms of supporting clients, supporting communities, and through some very, very difficult times around the world. Our, our team in Ukraine, we have a bank there. Um, it did extraordinary things to help support the Ukrainian economy and, and keeping the doors open every single day. So I'd start from that point of view that I, I do think that there are win-wins here. Um, and I think you've got to be mindful of what are the needs of your people at different points in time, and making sure that you're addressing them so that they can deliver excellence to clients and to the job. That, I think, so what did we learn? We learned that um, you are, that we do want people collaborating, in, and they do collaborate better together. Apprenticeship is really important. I know when, when I grew up, I kind of learned the hard way by watching and learning from um, certainly some eccentric and wonderful characters that uh, taught me, um, and that apprenticeship model, that feedback's important, and it does happen when you tend to be together more readily. But at the same time, we don't have to go back to the 80s model that sort of epitomized Wall Street either. And you know, we try and send more of our juniors home at the end of the day so they can work from there. So I think there's a, I do believe that there's an important balance here. Um, in productivity, you can see how productive someone is or isn't. And if they're not being productive, we bring them back to the office or back to the site, and we give them the coaching they need until they get their productivity back up again. I think the bigger question's going to be when we get through the next couple of years, what happens to the labor supply? I think we're in for a world of pretty tight labor supply. We're not seeing people coming back um, who had left the workforce in anything like the numbers we expected. And that's even with a pending recession and some of the inflationary challenges. So I think we're going to have to keep listening to our people and getting that balance right. Um, but if you don't listen to them, I think you're in danger of having some problems. I want to wrap up with one question yep. from the audience here. And I'd not be a faithful reporter if I didn't include the compliment. <laughs> it says, hi, Jane. Firstly, congratulations on that fantastic runway you're building in city. So there you go. But this is a really important question. When will we see city play a bigger role in key emerging markets? And it lists specifically India, Uzbekistan yeah. at all. It is a terribly important question because as we talk about the global economy, yeah. some of the economies are getting left behind, certainly not India, no. but there are economies that are getting left behind. Yeah. How much is that an impediment to overall growth? Yeah, look, there are some economies, uh, India is one I, um, I, I visited in July, which you only visit in July in the middle of, if it's very, very important to you given how hot it is there. It's, it is fascinating, what an extraordinary economy. It's amazing to see what's going on there. Middle East, also amazing to see what's going on. A lot of the discussions we're having, particularly interestingly with a lot of our Middle Eastern clients, is what are they doing about Africa? I, I, and I think Africa is one that we've all got to keep our mind on because that is where the net growth in the workforce is going to come over the next few decades. And um, if we get it right, it's a wonderful opportunity. If we don't, it's going to cause a lot of problems, both in Africa, as well as in Europe, as well as other parts of the world. And so looking at how do we build out transmission networks, greener supply chains there, get that middle class, get the SMEs uh, operating there healthily. That's very important. Um, and yes, we should all focus on it. It's also wonderful when we do enable progress around the world. That's a good thing.